you deserve probably an extra beer tonight. <laughs> Plus, it's very hot. But, I mean, outside, uh, inside is not too hot. So the session for today is going to be about Kubernetes CI/CD pipelines from containerized databases. So the topic we're going to be touching on are Kubernetes. So what is a Kubernetes pipeline? It's a pipeline run entirely inside Kubernetes. And for this, we're going to talk about Tecton. Who's familiar with Tecton? No one? Or oh, a little bit? So we're going to talk about it. Um, we're going to see two types of pipeline. One more for de who is a developer? Okay, some of you. So more of a dev pipeline. How do I work with databases in, in this pipeline if I want to change things? How can I combine this with the rest of my application? And uh, yeah, and the rest is Tecton, as I said, containerized databases. Uh, who is a DB admin? I don't know if that job exists anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always asking, and I never have like any hands up. So yeah, we're going to see. Why, I mean, is it a good idea or not to run a container in the databases? And we're going to talk a little bit about the differences between deployment and stateful sets. Who knows Kubernetes already, who's familiar, familiar with the concepts? A little bit. We're going to touch on this at the beginning just to set the stage. So, my name is Nick. Um, I'm, a dev, um, I'm the head of, uh, I'm heading the DevRel team at Spectral Cloud. I've been working with Kubernetes for the last uh, six years. Doesn't, mean, doesn't make me younger. Both both on the CNI, so more network side, uh, when I was at Cisco, and CSI, I worked for a company <coughs> called Ondat uh, or Storage OS. I don't know if anyone is familiar with this. It's distributed storage for, um, for Kubernetes, essentially. So let's get started. First, just to set the stage, um, how, if you were to run a database, what are the, the basic constructs you would use in Kubernetes? So you have two choices. Uh, typically, Kubernetes run, oh, I'm happy to have this now, I don't have to point away, this is magic. So, typically in Kubernetes, you're, you're, you're running pods. The pods can have one or more containers, and those pods in Kubernetes are controlled by a controller. The high level controller that, you know, if the pods fails, it's reprovision it, you know, just to make sure the, the, the right number of pods or the desired number of pods is running. So we have two types, we have deployment and we have stateful set. Deployments is stateless container or often referred as you know, cattle. You don't care about it, they don't have any stable identity. If one pod is um, dead, then another one will be restarted with another DNS name, another IP address, all of that. Um, deployment have um, interesting properties in the sense that when you define a PVC in Kubernetes, this is I want to attach a volume to my pods. I want to store data in my pod. When you have more than one pod, right, they all share, you, you define the, the deployment, you define one PVC, and they all share that particular definition. Which means that if you run a PVC in a traditional access mode, which is read write, read, write once, so not an NFS share or anything, something you like locally to your disk, what that means, it means that the first pod will claim it, will own it, but the other one will try to write inside this one, but it won't be possible. Only the first one will be able to write in this volume. So what that means is, is that if you need multiple pods to get access to the same volume, then you need something like an NFS share and run read-write many access mode. Right? This is the only way to make a deployment work with multiple pods who need to access the same data. Right? That's stateless, which means that PVC, first off, is the only um, way for the data to persist. So if you create a deployment and want the pod to have stateful data, you have to use PVC. If it's a deployment, PVC, multiple pods, then you need NFS share, which is probably out of the question for a database. And that's the point what I'm trying to show here, is that if you're running a database, then it's probably a better idea to use stateful set because what you need is a stable identity, especially if you're building a cluster of database, right? Here, imagine this is a database cluster where every pod is one member of that cluster. The difference between stateful set and deployment is part of the declaration of your configuration, so the YAML file. Inside a stateful set, you have on a per pod basis you have one instance of PVC as opposed to a single one here. So what that means is that every pod 
has its own storage volume, own storage capacity, can write uniquely at once, RWO, read write once, into that particular PVC. So that's one reason you want to run stateful set. As I said, the second one is because when this pod dies, so the stateful set controller will reprovision this pod with exactly the same ID, exactly the same DNS name, and exactly the same pod uh, name as well. Right? So it's really the way to provide a stable identity inside Kubernetes. Anything that is stateful in Kubernetes should run in a stateful set. That's the basic rule. Right? So, this is, so bear this in mind for the rest of the, of the conversation. This is what that means. Stateless, deployment, stateful, stateful set, hence the name stateful set. Okay, but at the same time, if you want to run a database into uh, the new world of cloud native, you inherit those properties like scalability, elasticity, self-feeling, observability, all of that is great for, you know, it's new qualities, new um, features for your databases because they inherently inherit this from Kubernetes because this is what the platform provides. But uh, when you run a database from, you know, you go from a SAN or, you know, like a big, um, a big, um, big array, you still need the enterprise feature that we're provisioned with this array. This is why I ask, you know, who is a DBA? Because DBA know that you need replication, you need the system to be distributed, you may need encryption. Uh, eventually, because we are in cloud native, you may need self-provisioning and be DevOps friendly, right? So all those features, are not, at least the first three ones, they're not inside Kubernetes. And this is the, the other part when running stateful set, is that you have to, to ask yourself this question. How do I provide this inside Kubernetes? And the answer is via the CSI, the Container Storage Interface. Again, Kubernetes just provides the interface for your storage features. So depending on the CSI, so you have Storage OS, Ceph, uh, Portworks, all those companies that provide these extra features in a particular, from the particular CSI, right? So be careful of the CSI you use, especially in products in production where you need like things like encryption for the databases, replication, all of that. Of course, you may have duplicated function in the sense that the database itself can provide replication. But remember, if you lose your pod, you are going to start from an empty PVC, right? So it, you will not, you will need to replicate from nothing up to all your data. If you do storage-based replication, when, when you're going to restart your failed pod, you only have to replicate the delta, right? So that's the main difference why you need hardware-based replication and let's say software-based replication or replication from the database itself. Okay, another reason if, you know, for people who are asking, should I use, uh, should I run a database inside Kubernetes? Well, this is from a data, a data log uh, report that the top is listing the top technologies running on containers. And you can see that Redis, Postgres, Elastic, Kafka, Rabbit, Mongo, MySQL, and Vault, all of that are stateful workloads. Right? So obviously, they are running in containers. So with, what that means is that already, even before, before Kubernetes, those technologies were uh, popular to run in containers. So now the top containers image running in Kubernetes stateful sets, again, you find exactly the same ones. So what does that mean is that people who are running those technology, they do it in a stateful set. So definitely stateful set is the way to go. But it's not the only thing. So what we've seen so far is just the database, storage, the capacity, the features. But how about the application layer? How do you install the database? Because if you have the, your database controlled, the pods controlled by a stateful set, okay, it's going to maintain a certain number, number of pods. It can you know, do rolling updates, all those things. But how about what is running inside those containers? How do, I, do you make sure that the database is installed properly, the cluster is installed properly? How do you monitor this? Well, by using operators. So who is familiar with operators? Some of you. So let me explain for the others what an operator is inside Kubernetes. So Kubernetes is basically an, exten an extensible API. Right? So every object inside Kubernetes lives within this API space. So you've, you will find things like pod, um, daemon set, stateful set, all of these exist as first class citizens inside Kubernetes. 
but there's no such things as MongoDB inside, as an object inside Kubernetes. And the idea of the operator is to create what we call a custom resource definition, which, we, which will make MongoDB first class citizen inside Kubernetes. So that Kubernetes now, is know, now knows what a MongoDB is. And that's the first part, that's the API definition. I'm extending the Kubernetes API to make Kubernetes aware of what a MongoDB is. Then the second part is a custom resource. So it's an instance of that particular object definition. So it's basically a YAML file, the same way you create a pod or a service or a secret, you can create a MongoDB cluster, right? By respecting the particular syntax that you have set in the CRD. And then the third part is the custom controller. So the custom controller, you can think about it as a runtime environment that manage your custom application. In our particular case, we've extended Kubernetes with CRD MongoDB. The role of this runtime is to make sure that whatever I do as a custom resource, the controller watches for the create, update, update, delete operation on that one. It takes appropriate action to make your desired state living inside Kubernetes. So if I create a MongoDB resource as a custom resource here, as a YAML file, the custom controller makes sure that everything I mention in this custom resource will be living in the cluster. So creating basically this application layer, installing MongoDB, making the right number um, of nodes in, in, um, uh, inside the, you know, the, the cluster, making sure sometimes providing backup capabilities, all that is encapsulated into uh, the custom resource for the definition and inside the customer controller logic that will perform all the automation, right? So all of that is what we call an operator. So it's the, oper the custom controller, the custom resource, and the custom source resource definition. So now we have three things, right? We have um, the operator, we have the stateful set, and we have the CSI. Those are the three components you need to think about when deploying databases inside Kubernetes. So you, didn't, you don't have to build this yourself, right? The operator, you can find your preferred vendor, um, like Mongo, they have enterprise, they have community operators. Uh, there is company out there that specialize in building operators. For etcd, there's the improbable uh, operators. Uh, if you go on operatorhub.io, you will find all the possible operators to manage pretty much everything from Redis, MongoDB, and even non-stateful application. But yeah, that's the third part. So uh, today we're gonna see uh, the Marvel app, which is an app I've built for, um, to demonstrate MongoDB and to build a full application on top of this and create some CI pipeline. If you go on this link, you will see I've got a full three-part blog if you want to replicate the same configuration at home. Okay, so this application um, profile is that one. So if we start with the top, uh, we have multiple front-end I know Flask is supposed to be a backend, but it's exposing uh, HTML uh, by using the bootstrap uh, plugin in, uh, in Flask. Then I have a three node um, MongoDB cluster that is, uh, that is deployed, MongoDB is deployed as a stateful set, inheriting from the stor a storage class. So the storage class, this is basically how you map the CSI to your um, stateful set. So the CSI layer, like all the features, are controlled via the storage class. So if you want to enable things like replication and encryption, is by using a storage class that has this enable, and then you say for the stateful set, oh by the way, use that particular storage class. This is how you make the link between your PVC, your volumes, and the storage feature set you want to expose for your database, right? Um, and then, so this is Typically what you do in a stateful set, stateful set, you configure a volume claim template, you associate a storage class, and then you say, I want, you know, uh, when you deploy a pod controlled by a stateful set, it will have an individual PVC as we see, as we seen in the beginning, as opposed to the deployment, right? So one per pod, individual PVC, all enabled with the feature that is sitting there, right? And the rule, uh, this application, what it's doing, Actually, the front-end Flask 
application is going to pull um, Marvel character from the Marvel APIs, store them into a MongoDB databases, and display some random cards containing the Marvel uh, character information. Right. So um, this is the pipeline that we are going to run. But essentially, it's two different pipelines. Uh, the first one, I will, I will show it live. The second one, as I said, I messed up, so I will show you the video. But the first one, which is on my laptop, right? How do I control the pipeline on my laptop if I want to, to de develop my application and um, change code live, for example? So what we are going to do is, uh, so we have our application code store in Git repository. Um, then, of course, we have uh, Docker Hub. We can build images, publish them to Docker Hub. And we're going to use Customize as a way to deploy the manifest into our cluster. So who is familiar with Customize? A little bit. So Customize basically take raw manifest and apply some customization. For example, you could say, uh, I'm in my dev environment. And because Mongo is now a native resource in Kubernetes, you can control things like the size, right? The number of nodes. So you could say, um, locally, please deploy only MongoDB on one node, and I just need one gig of space, right? Now, when you go to the um, production, let's say, pipeline, things get a bit more complicated, right? So we're going to be using a tool called Scaffold um, to build our images. It's like, you can think about it as Docker Compose, but for Kubernetes. It's helping building application, building containers, and running custom uh, Docker build commands, right? For uh, production, we're going to push our code into a Git repository. Then a Tekton pipeline should be triggered, but I'm going to do it manually in the video. So Tekton is a pipeline, the same way like Scaffold will, will uh, be doing the pipeline bits locally on your laptop, Tekton is going to do it inside Kubernetes. And every task, every step of the Tekton pipeline will be a container, will be a task that runs as a container. So everything will be running in Kubernetes. And the task of Tekton will be, again, build the image, build the manifest with Customize, publish the Customize manifest on the Git repository that is monitored by Flux. So who is familiar by, with Flux? So Flux is a GitOps tool that allows you to monitor Git repository. And anything that is published in this repository will be deployed in Kubernetes. So why should you do that? because it's more secure. You don't want to deploy to production using kubectl, like here. I mean, Scaffold will be doing the deployment, but using kubectl. In production, don't do kubectl. It's bad, right? You love it. Do you have any experience with this? <laughs> so typically, the manifest, you publish them somewhere as a Helm chart. I mean, there's a variety of things you can do, but for the sake of simplicity today, we're going to publish, just going to publish raw manifest from um, uh, customize, run as a task in Tekton, and uh, Flux will be monitoring the, the repo. As soon as the manifest get uploaded into that repo, Flux will provision all the manifests into the cluster, but this time with different properties, right? We will have the three node databases, we may need more, uh, more storage, and we may enable encryption, uh, uh, you know, replication, deduplication, all those kind of things just by changing things with, cust uh, with, uh, with customize, with customize somewhere. using customize here and here, you have the same base manifests, and then you can tweak a little bit of, you know, you can patch the manifest, saying I want this amount of storage, or I want you know, that many um, nodes, I want replication, actually you have all the features there, replication, encryption, and the, this only one replica or no replica at all, right? just by using customize, different patches. Okay, so let's go for the demo. It's been what twenty minutes, so we have yeah, ten minutes. Ten minutes. That should be enough. So, yeah, <laughs> okay, so let's go here. So I'm going to show you live the the scaffold part. So scaffold again, very simple syntax. Here um, I'm using. A name, the image I want to build, the Docker, you know, image, um, the, the, the name for the artifact, the context, the Docker build context, 
and a build command. So typically you don't need a build command, but I'm using an uh, M1, so I'm using on I'm using ARM, so I need to use um, Docker build X to cross compile. Right? This, this is why I need this script. But you can use just use native Docker if you're running on x86. Right? Local push through in that I want to push the image to my locker, uh, local Docker daemon as well. And here, this is the path to customize. So you can see I have my dev overlay. My dev, so in customize, the overlay is the patching. What do I need to change to apply this in my, uh, in my, uh, this one. yeah. So for example, for Mongo, this is my overlay. And I say I need only one member, right? For example, here. And I think the storage is two gig. Right, so this is, in production, I will have something different. I don't have it here because it's, it will be built by my Tecton pipeline. So my Tecton pipeline is going to build my, um, my, um, my customized manifest as well. So it's just to show you there, like, you know, with customized, depending on the environment, you can easily deploy depending on your needs. Okay, so this is basically what you need. And then scaffold can run in multiple modes. You can do scaffold build. Scaffold run. So here I'm just making sure that I'm running in my development environment, which is this Kubernetes cluster. We're going to be using um, K9s. So I don't know if you guys are familiar with K9s, but it's probably one of the best tools to monitor and to do any sort of operation in, in Kubernetes. So this is my uh, current cluster, let's say my development cluster. And scaffold is going to create a new ne uh, de uh, namespace called dev and deploy everything into that, that namespace. So for this, I could do scaffold build, but what I want to do is also change my code live. So as soon as I change the code, I hit save and everything is getting deployed again into my cluster with the updated code. So I don't have to go through the whole Docker build manually, update the image, and redeploy. This is this feature I want to show you today. So if I do scaffold dev, so it's going to build the image, and then it's going to start the deployment, and it's going to log all the container logs. So you can see the logs live from here. So this is my Flask model. This is my front end. And if you see now in K9s, there is a new namespace called dev. And you can see that the Marvel front end is deploying. So in customize, I've chosen three. In prod, I think I have five. And MongoDB, one single instance. So the operator, remember, is controlling how I should deploy MongoDB. So the operator, the operator is now deploying the MongoDB database. And the add data is just like the job that is going to pull all the API information from Marvel and store them in Mongo. So it should fail because the first time, it's a job. So it's going to repeat until it's successful, until the DB is ready. So it's, this one is ready. So uh, actually, it should already be working. So yeah, you can see here, this is all the, the API request from the Marvel API. So now I should be able to test my application. So to test my application, uh, still using K9S, I go to my service. I've got my front-end service. If you create uh, just Shift uh, F for port forward, I want to redirect this service to my local host. 8080. So now I should be able. This is my Marvel application. So it's running. So you can see I'm going to make, make a quick change to show you the difference. It's commit. I want to add an S. So I'm going to back, go back here. I'm going to go just for my port forward. I'm going to delete the one I have. Okay. I'm going to go into my code. So you can see, if I go back here, I'm, I still see the logs, right? I go to my app uh, template, the page. I'm going to find, uh, to look for a commit. And I'm going to replace my commits for all the instances, right? 
And then look, I'm going to say hit uh, command S or control S. And if it works, yeah, you can see it's now rebuilding everything and redeploying everything. So now I should see new container coming. You can see two seconds. So it's changing, deleting the, the old one, creating the new ones. So now if I go to my service again, I'm again creating the port forward. I go back here. So now my application has been updated. So you don't have, to, so the value here is you don't have to rebuild. You have probably, probably saved, I don't know, five minutes from building everything. Imagine, you know, if you have to change the code hundreds of times a day, that's hundreds of times, 10 minutes you're saving, right? So that's for your local laptop. Then I'm going to move to the second part. Five minutes, right? Five minutes. Okay, that's perfect on time. Actually, ten if you want to take this. Yeah, it's fine. Just keep it so clear. I'm just sorry, like I messed up my clusters. I'm missing some storage class, so I have to use my backup video. But I'm just gonna uh, show you what I'm doing here. So same principle. I'm gonna use Tecton. So Tecton is basically you create. I'm gonna. I'm not gonna explain every concept, but Tecton has you run pipelines. Pipelines um, are composed of tasks, and normally you have three tasks. I have build docker image, I have um, then use customize to create my customization file, and I have git to git command to upload the customized file into my repository. But I don't have that task here because Tekton has a marketplace where you can just use YAML file, apply them to your cluster with built-in tasks. The only thing you have to do is give some scripts. So for example, here I'm using the git task, and this is my git commands. And then Tekton just ask, act as a wrapper around my command. So the point is, there's a marketplace, it's very easy to use. Even though the structure is kind of, not complicated, but as everything, you have to get your, your head around it. But then for every task, you can either build your own or use one from the marketplace. So pipelines are composed of tasks. Tasks are using resources, and then you have the pipeline run. So basically, as everything in Kubernetes, you trigger the Tecton pipeline by applying the pipeline run manifest, which is what I'm doing here. So I'm just creating, so <coughs> kubectl creates pipeline, and just I'm just going to monitor what's happening in the logs. So just by doing this, you're going to see it's going to trigger my first, um, my first task as a container. So every task is going to be a container. And you can see within that container what's happening. So it's building the image. The same thing I've done with scaffold is doing this. And by using the TKM uh, pipeline logs command, it's displaying the same thing as what is happening here. So you have two choices. Either you use the uh, TKM command to see the logs of all the tasks, or you can use every container, so it's still building, you can use every container that's for every task, go into that container and display the logs as well. The difference is here, it's everything in a single place. So here, still building the image, downloading you know, the required, the mypip uh, requirement.txt. So really building the image from scratch and uh, pushing it into my upstream repo, uh, registry, sorry. Right? And now, so you can see this task is done. Now I'm moving to another task, which is building the customized manifest. So again, I'm logging to that container, and what is here is exactly the same as here. Now it's done with that, I believe. So customized manifest, things should be done very soon. Third one. So the third one is uh, basically you know, the pushing the manifest using my git from the marketplace, my git task for the marketplace and uploading this into my manifest repository, then that Flux is monitoring. As soon as Flux, you can see, I'm monitoring, so Flux is monitoring. As soon as it sees that there is new manifest on the repo, you will see reconciling. And as soon as it does reconciling, the manifest should be deployed into my Kubernetes cluster. But this time, with the customization I've set up for my production environment. So that will be a three node MongoDB database. And I think I just put one gig of storage. But I mean, I need more storage in there than in production. It doesn't make sense, but it's just to show you that it's possible. 
So you can see like I have more um, more front end pods. I think I have uh, I have five. If I go back here, and you can see that the new revision, so the new manifests on the repo have been applied here, and you can see one, two, three, four, five, and the three tasks from Tekton are now completed. So my deployment uh, of my application is basically done. So the last step is basically, so you can see the MongoDB cluster is still deploying, so this time three node, three node, taking a bit more time. So my job is gonna fail probably once or twice. So, and you can see also the PVC have been deployed with one gig of storage, the first six ones, the data vo volume as well as the log volume. And I think that's the last bit. So yeah, you can go to the model front end now. And same thing. Now it's uh, because it's running in a cloud, it does have an external IP. I don't have to redirect to my local host. So now the only thing that remains is basically doing the same thing, testing that the application is running and working with this public IP address, 8080. And yeah, it is now running. So, but it's easy, it was a video, so. <laughs> okay, so that was it for the, the demo. Um, so, and yeah, that's pretty much the end of it. Key takeaways for today. So databases can happily be run as container, provided you have the right tooling in place. So you have to figure out the enterprise data features when migrating from SAN or NAS to Kubernetes. So we've seen you have to think about the CSI, you have to think about stateful set versus deployment, of course it's going to be stateful set, and you have to choose uh, so say, of course, your CSI wisely and your operator wisely as well. And make sure that you are using the right pipeline tooling. So Scaffold is one example. Uh, I just did another lab on DevSpace, which is also a good alternative to Scaffold. Uh, for your main CI pipeline, it's up to you. I've shown Tekton, because Tekton is Kubernetes, and we had Kubernetes in the title. It also allows you to repeat the same principle everywhere. So you can be on-prem, in Google, in Azure, in Oracle Cloud. As long as you have a Kubernetes cluster, you will be able to use Tekton, rather than the individual cloud-specific, vendor-specific um, pipelines. And as I said, you know, I'm part of Spectral Cloud, and if you want to run stateful applications in Spectral, actually, or even you know, any cluster, what we do provide is a, you know, layers that you can build and are repeatable in any cloud. Once you have your cluster profile defined, we provide things like backup, scanning, and all that using open source tools like Velero. So that's also another option. I mean, there's Spectral, but not only Spectral. If you run some cluster somewhere, you have to think about the backup. Right, that's another thing I didn't mention. There is replication, but you also need backups. So whether you use Velero, Spectral as the platform which is using Velero, or um, Kasten, uh, by, uh, yeah, Kasten, they also have other solutions. They are operators that also provide backup solution, but also think about your backup. And that's pretty much it for today.